We've got a kind of abstract section ahead of us compared to what we often um, have in this course. Let's kick off with, um, no, let's kick off with a little motivation. Because since this is abstract, it would be nice to think we're going somewhere concrete with it. Suppose that you have an ellipse in maybe pre-calculus, you learn about ellipses. And in that class, you only learn about ellipses in standard form. So you learn about ellipses whose major axis is horizontal or whose major axis is vertical. And you don't really learn anything at all about ellipses whose, I'm not going to be able to just erase part of that. You don't learn anything at all about ellipses whose major axis is not vertical or not horizontal. So you might ask how you would deal with an ellipse that has this as its major axis. And that as its minor axis. And one way of doing that would be to think of the ellipse as existing independently of the Cartesian plane. That is to say, you could take the x-axis and the y-axis, and you could erase them, and then you could draw in a new x-axis and a new y-axis, and suddenly your ellipse has gone into standard form. In fact, it's even centered at the origin. This is an example of what's called a change of basis. And if we want to talk about this in any way, we are going to need some background ground information. And we're going to start with the unique representation theorem. You can usually tell a theorem is significant if it has its own name. Um, this says, suppose we have a vector space and we have a basis. Then any vector in the vector space can be uniquely represented using the basis vector. 
characters. What's this supposed to mean? Well, let's look at an example where we have a spanning set that's not a basis. Let's look at R2, and let's look at a set. I don't want to call it B, because I'm using B for bases. One, two, two, five, negative one, one. This is not a basis. of R2, but it does span R2, meaning that every vector in R2, let me start warming up the calculator, we're probably gonna need it, meaning that every vector in R2 is a linear combination of these things. So like W equals one um one three. Yeah, just coming up with something kind of at random here. This if if I'm right in saying that this set spans R2, W ought to be a linear combination of these vectors. And we can investigate this using Gauss-Jordan elimination. For any online students watching this after the fact, I'm going to get this into my calculator and then I'll share it so that you can see it. So I'm going to matrix edit. We've got a two by four matrix. First column, one, two. Second column, two, five. Third column, <coughs> negative one, one. Last column, one, three. And now let me keep my promise and share this. If we go to matrix, some entry delay here, reduced row echelon form, stick A in there. We see that we have a free variable. So this does have solutions. Our vector is a linear combination of the others, but there are infinitely many solutions. So there are an infinite number of ways that we can write that vector as a linear combination of the vectors in the spanning set. Well, my claim is that if I have not just a spanning set, but a basis, that won't happen. The representation will be unique. So it's my claim. Let's just accept this 
at least for now, that if I erase that third vector, the result is a basis. So if it's a basis, it's still a spanning set, and 1, 3 should still be a linear combination of the remaining vectors. But now, there should be a unique solution to this equation. At least that's what the spanning set theorem is claiming. Go to our calculator. Let's see, one, two, two, five, one, three. One, two, two, five, one, three, and we perform the Gauss-Jordan elimination, and this time there are no free variables, and we have a unique solution. C1 is negative 1, C2 is positive 1. And the spanning set theorem says that that's always true. It didn't matter that I had this particular basis. It didn't matter that I have this particular W. If I have a basis and I have a vector, that vector will be uniquely representable in terms of the basis vectors. And I've stated this, I've done my example in R2, but this is true for any vector space and any basis. So, for example, it's true if I let W be sitting in the vector space of continuous functions, and I say that W has a basis of the sine of x the cosine of x and x squared. If this is a basis of w, then any vector in w can be uniquely written as C1 times the sine of x plus c2 times the cosine of x plus c3 times x squared. And this gives us a very compact way of storing these vectors. Because if every vector can be written this way, then the only difference between the vectors in W are what those constants C1, C2, C3 are. 
And that means that this vector v can be compactly stored as C1, C2, C3. So this vector space is, in one sense, it seems like a complicated vector space. Like if I asked you to graph in your head two times the sine of x minus 10 times the cosine of x, plus 5x squared, probably no one in this room has a very clear idea of what that vector looks like. And yet, in another sense, it must be quite simple because it's being completely and perfectly stored using the basis and using these column vectors in R3 that we've been using since the first week of class. And this is what we're going to kind of investigate. And especially, we're going to make much of the fact that the representation depends on the basis. So let's say we have the same basis. Let me keep the order consistent. The sine, the cosine x squared. And I have the function 2 times the sine plus 3 times the cosine minus x squared. Then this function can be stored in terms of that basis as 2, 3, negative one. But again, let's just accept this without a fight. If I turn that sine of x into twice the sine, this is still a basis of the same set. It's still a basis of this, um, this vector space W. And I can still take 2 times the sine plus 3 times the cosine minus x squared, and I can still store this as a vector, but now this is one times the first basis element, and my vector is one, three, negative one. So we can sort of store or represent, if you prefer a slightly more formal sounding word, 
these vectors as column vectors, but the method of that storage, I mean the precise way that the vector is stored, depends on the basis. This can become very confusing if you're looking at Rn. Let's look at R2 with the standard basis 1, 0, 0, 1. And let's take a vector the vector 4, 7. The, uh, the unique representation theorem says that 4, 7 can be uniquely represented. It's a well-named theorem. And in particular, this is 4 times the first basis element plus seven times the second basis element. If we want to store this vector the way we stored these functions, we would take these coefficients and turn them into a um into a vector and in particular the vector 4 7 is stored as the vector 4 7 um all very good and natural so far But what if we had a different basis? What if we have C equals one, one, three, negative two? We're going to see, by the way, by the end of next week, I'm just putting these things on the whiteboard and I'm saying, this is a basis, this is a basis, and it's how do I know? We'll see how I know. It's, um, by the end of next week, it will be clear to you as well that this really is a basis. For now, let's just accept it. According to the unique representation theorem, <coughs> we can uniquely store the vector in terms of the other vectors and you should be able at this point to solve this, make, this vector equation without a lot of hassle, um, just using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So 1, 1, 3, negative 2, 4, 7. 1, 1, 3, negative 2. Four, seven, one, one, three, negative two, four, seven. So I uh, did not mean to do that, but fine, quit out. So five point eight and negative point.
And now, if we are storing this vector the way we've been storing vectors so far, the vector for seven is being stored as 5.8, negative 0.6. And this obviously has the potential to be quite confusing. We have a column vector, we have a basis, we use the basis to encode the column vector, but our encoded column vector and our actual vector for seven are different. So let's try to nail down the notation that will allow us to do stuff like this without any confusion. And the notation is we take the vector x down here, we write the name of the basis. I've been using b. And this statement is as follows. x is the vector we want to encode or represent, if you prefer. Um, X is some vector in some vector space. It could be a function, a matrix, a sequence, a column vector, whatever. It could be anything. B is our basis, and C is the encoding vector. And C then is a vector in Rn. Going back a frame, um, this notation is kind of, kind of awkward because you've got these little, you've got these little brackets in the notation, but we also use brackets for something else. We use brackets for column vectors. So it's always a little awkward looking, but if you take the vector for seven and you represent it using the basis C, you get 5.8 negative Point six, And that statement above that horizontal line is, is something similar. If you take this same vector, but now you are using the basis B, then four seven is encoded as four seven. So the particular representation depends on the basis that you use. So we can, for example, just to 
nail all of this down a bit. Let's work in R2. And let's say we have a vector 1, 2, and a basis of R2 And again, let's just for now take my word that this really is a basis. And let's take this vector and encode it. Let's represent it. And to do that, I mean, this vector, to do that, it's going to be just solving a vector equation. We're going to write this vector in terms of the basis vectors. And that B1 and that B2 are going to give us the answer to this question. And once again, this is just a quick or hopefully quick bit of gauss jordan elimination. Let's see, 216412. Two one six four one two. Two one six four one two. And we perform the elimination. Negative four and one point five. So when we represent this vector in terms of that basis, that's what we get. And we can also ask questions sort of in the other direction. If when we encode a vector using this basis, we get one, three, what is the vector v? And this question basically amounts to remembering, I mean, remembering what this notation means. This notation says that v is 1 times the first basis vector plus three times the second basis vector. So that's what? 18 plus two is 20. 12 plus one is 13. So one direction is easier than the other because it doesn't require any Gauss-Jordan elimination. But if at least in Rn, where we have Gauss-Jordan elimination, um, if you want to encode a vector, you can do it. 
And if you've got an encoded vector and you want to recover what it was originally, you can do that too. Does anybody have any questions about this concept so far? Then I'm going, we're going to come back to this, but for now we're going to kind of use this concept as a springboard to a major definition, only semi-related to this. So notice that we, when we wanted to do this problem, so when we had this problem on the board without any of the other stuff, can't help thinking there should be a quicker way to erase, but I've never found it if there is. We found B1 and B2 via, um, via solving a vector equation using Gauss-Jordan elimination. We could also think of this in terms of matrix vector multiplication. You know, systems of linear equations, um, vector equations and matrix equations, they're all the same thing. And this is the same as solving the matrix equation that I am now writing on Board. And this matrix here gets a special bit of notation, P sub B. So you know, notice that the name of the basis, this B, appears in the notation. I mean, this matrix has the basis vectors as its columns. So this matrix is clearly very closely related to the basis. It just, um, it's just, in fact, the matrix that has those vectors as its columns. So, definition, if B is a basis, the matrix, let me put the in quotation marks, the matrix that has the vectors of B as its columns is written as P sub B. Um, we're playing a little loose with sort of terminology here, which is why I put those quotation marks around the. Um, there is more than one matrix that has the vectors of the basis as its columns, 
right? I mean, you could go back here and you have this basis and you could say, okay, six, four, two, one, that is a matrix that has the basis vectors as its columns, but it's not what I called P sub B. And going back to what I said about us playing a little loose with terminology here, sets are not ordered. So if you have a basis, you are not make, and you write it using set notation, you are not really, in a formal sense, making any kind of statement about what order the basis vectors are written in. I mean, from a purely set theoretic point of view, this basis here and this basis here are the same basis. I mean, they have the same vectors in them. They're sets, sets aren't ordered, but we kind of have to treat, I mean, treat the sets as being ordered, right? because the order that the basis vectors are in is giving you the vector. Like this four becomes the first element of the vector because it's attached to the first vector. This seven becomes the second element of this because it's attached to the second basis vector. So I'm going to just sort of hand wave all of this with the remark that we are sort of treating these sets as being ordered, even though you should know from foundations or wherever that sets aren't ordered. That was a bit of a digression, but I think kind of an important one. So we have this terminology, um, the matrix that has the vectors of B as its columns. And by this I mean that the first basis vector is the first column, the second basis vector is the second column, and so on, is written P sub B and P sub B has a heck of a name. It's not very convenient at all. It's the change of coordinate matrix from the basis B to the standard basis. And that name is a bit cryptic. I mean, What's this about the standard basis? We're just going to let it sit there for a moment and maybe in two sections or so. So maybe Thursday of next week, we'll come back to this and we'll get some clarification on what this stuff about the standard basis is indicating here. This P sub B appears in the following equation. A vector X 
is the change of coordinate matrix P sub B times X represented in terms of B. And this P sub B is invertible. I know that P sub B is invertible because its columns are the vectors of B, meaning that its columns are linear the independent, because any basis is a set of linear the independent vectors. And then the invertible matrix theorem says that all of the columns being linearly independent is the same as a matrix being invertible. So we can also write that the inverse of this matrix times x equals was this. And what I'm really getting at here is that the transformation that sends X to its representation in terms of B is a linear transformation, because this transformation can be thought of in terms of matrix multiplication. T of X equals a matrix times X. And going back to what I said sort of earlier when we were first introducing inverses about not caring so much about what inverses are, just getting kind of theoretical information from it, we're probably never going to actually compute one of these inverse matrices in the class. But the fact that it is invertible tells us that this transformation is linear. And in fact, via the invertible matrix theorem, it tells us more than that. It tells us that this transformation is onto and it tells us that this transformation is one-to-one. -one. We get all of that from the mere fact that the inverse exists without actually computing any inverses. And we are now going to turn this into a major definition. Definition. A transformation T from one vector space to another is called an isomorphism. If it satisfies three conditions, and the precise three conditions that I outlined in the previous frame 
We need T to be linear. We need T to be onto, and we need T to be one, two, one. If all of those conditions are satisfied, T is called an isomorphism, and V and W are said to be isomorphic. What's the intuition? behind isomorphisms. I mean, we now have them as a formal definition, but what, did, what does it mean to say that two spaces are isomorphic? Well, from a vector, Space point of view isomorphic spaces are identical. So if we're just doing vector space math, if we're not dragging in definitions from other branches of mathematics, isomorphic vector spaces are identical. They're the same thing. And I mean, this isn't necessarily exact, but the easiest sort of analog might be our standard decimal number system versus binary. So you have the same number in both systems. It looks different. It's like, um, here you have two, here you have one zero, so it looks like they're different things, but actually they're just the integers, they're just the natural numbers, say. So they look different, but actually they're identical. And we have the same kind of thing here. As in example, we might look at P sub 2. Which is all of the polynomials that look like this. This has as its standard basis one x and x squared. And if you take a polynomial and you represent it in terms of this standard basis, you get the column vector a0, a1, a2. And I made the observation a few frames ago 
I mean, I hadn't defined isomorphisms yet. But I made the observation that the transformation that sends a vector to its representation is an isomorphism. So this transformation that sends these polynomials to these vectors is an isomorphism. So from a vector space point of view, these polynomials and um, these column vectors are the same. And if that seems unintuitive to you, start asking yourself, well, what can you do to a polynomial that you cannot do to a column vector? And are any of the things that you can do to polynomials but not column vectors encodable in the language of vector spaces? Like, here's the obvious one. Polynomials are functions. You can evaluate them at different values of x. You can't do that with column vectors. So there's a difference between polynomials and column vectors. But that's not a vector space operation. In terms of vector spaces, here's what we can do. We can add, we can subtract, we can perform scaled or multiplication. Those are the only vector space operations we have. So if you're taking a polynomial and you're evaluating it at a value of x, you're now outside the realm of vector spaces. You're in the, some other branch of mathematics. Um, we can multiply two polynomials together. That's something we can't do with column vectors. But again, in order to talk about that, you have to move outside the realm of vector spaces. In vector spaces, you can add vectors, you can subtract them, you uh, can scale or multiply them, you cannot multiply two vectors together. So the instant you start talking about multiplying polynomials, you have left the realm of vector spaces. Purely in terms of addition, subtraction, and scale or multiplication, there is no difference between what amounts to just a list of numbers and the vector storing that list of numbers. And isomorphisms are incredibly powerful, especially isomorphisms to Rn, because we can work with Rn with a degree of ease that we cannot work with other vector spaces. Like, let me ask you a question to kind of round out the lecture. In P2, is the set of vectors 1 plus 2x 
squared 4 plus x plus 5 x squared and 3 plus 2x. Is this set dependent or independent? Now, unlike evaluating a polynomial at a number, Questions about dependence or independence fall entirely within the realm of vector spaces. The definition of dependence and independence involves the zero vector. It involves scalar multiplication. It involves adding vectors. It involves subtracting vectors. It involves two vectors being equal. It lives entirely in the realm of vector spaces. So this is a question that can be approached via isomorphism. If we make the observation that this vector is indistinguishable from its isomorphic image 1, 0, 2. And this vector is indistinguishable from 4, 1, 5. And this vector is indistinguishable from 3 to 0, well, then either these three column vectors and these three polynomials are both dependent sets or they're both independent sets. If one of them was dependent and the other was independent, that would be a method, totally inside vector spaces, of telling those apart. And my claim is that these vector spaces are identical and that from a linear algebra point of view, these polynomials and these vectors are identical. So either both these sets are dependent or both these sets are independent. Does everybody buy the logic behind this? Understand the argument being made? Then in P sub 2, we don't have any good way of solving equations involving polynomials. In R sub 3, if we want to know whether a bunch of vectors are dependent or independent, we do have a way of doing that. Will perform Gauss Jordan elimination. So you see that, that this isomorphism is so powerful because it lets us take the tools we have for R3 and apply them to a totally different space. And let me just get my calculator up real quick. I'm not up to uh, memorizing those vectors, so 
and not sharing. I mean, for online students looking at this after the fact, you're not seeing anything right now. Three rows, four columns. One, zero, two. I'm entering this into my calculator. Four, one, five. Three, two, zero. And we're interested in dependence and independence, so we're setting this equal to the zero vector. Finally, now we can all see this, and we can just perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. We, once again, hit the matrix A with the RREF command. And we find that there are free variables. Well, there is a free variable, meaning that this, um, this equation, these vectors set equal to zero, has infinitely many solutions, meaning this set of vectors is dependent. And then, because these things are indistinguishable from a vector space point of view, the fact that these column vectors are independent answers the question. These polynomials are also dependent. That brings us about to the end of this lecture. So we'll keep, uh, keep right on going next week. I'll see you then.